Namaste. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Awake, the Life of Yogananda. Today is a special episode. We have a special guest. Uh, before we do that, Mike and Chris, say hello. 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 Good morning, <laughs> good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> wherever you we are have, in the world. We have um, an esteemed guest today, Phil Philip Goldberg. We will call him Phil through the podcast. Phil, say hello. Hello, everybody. Great to be with you. Great. Um, Phil has generously agreed to 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 come come on board, and we were going to discuss some of the dialogue that he has in the minute in question. But Phil is such an interesting uh, person that we we may make this a special episode. So we'll see how this goes. So Phil, in the awake book, the life of Yogananda, the the books describes you in the back as an author of American of American Veda, how Indian spirituality changed the West. Philip, Philip Goldberg was raised in Brooklyn by atheists who disdained religion. In spite wow. of this, <laughs> they go that deep. <laughs> <laughs> in, in spite of this, he found himself from an early age to the pragmatic mysticism of the East through the writings of Alan Watts and Aldous Huxley and the classic texts of Taoism, Buddhism and Vedanta. He has written about psychology, human potential and holistic health and conducts lectures and workshops around the world. So, Phil, is that an accurate portrayal of Philip Goldberg? Yeah, it's, it's uh, concise. <laughs> it leaves out a lot, but it's 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 accurate enough. Yeah, good. It's interesting. They would choose to include that bit about being raised by my atheist parents. Oh, well, that's interesting because I would have thought that you would have actually had an input into that blurb. I may have. I just forget. But um, <laughs> it's an interesting choice. But, yeah, it uh, sounds like you're. If you said disdain is not a word you'd use, then perhaps that they did. No, they did true. have some. That is uh, true. I, people usually say things like, "Oh, my parents were not religious. My parents were anti-religious." <laughs> yeah, and and so, um, when people, you know, I've interviewed hundreds of people who uh, in, in, in the West, who uh, in America mainly, who um, adopt some form of spirituality born in, in, the, in India. Um, and often they have, they, they have abandoned the religion of their upbringing and then find the East and sometimes return to their uh, origins or sometimes not. That's very typical of Yogananda devotees. Uh, I have, and they all have something they end up unlearning in order to adopt a new form of spirituality like that. I had to unlearn uh, cynicism <laughs> about anything that seemed religious, which was a different task than, you know, becoming disillusioned with your religion or something like that. I had to see that there may be something of value. That is interesting. So you, you might describe as psychological scars, I suppose, that sometimes religious zealots do um, impinge on people, right? Yes, and I think my job was easier than than uh, if I had been raised by you know uh, religious parents. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, of course, part of part of being raised by them was to. Uh, not accept things on faith and to um, think for myself and think clearly, which was very compatible with the teachings of people like Yogananda and the other gurus who came. Would you say that um, being um, having parents that were atheists kind of made you go more into the opposite direction of becoming spiritual? I don't in know. Your life? I don't know because in my generation of seekers back in the 60s, late 60s, um, people came from all kinds of different backgrounds and ended up in the uh, counterculture uh, where people were exploring. And, and so, you know, I, I think of my friends and some of them came from very uh, strict religious households and some were Christians and some were Jews and, you know, some were uh, whatever else. And, um, and others you know, were raised in, in rural areas and others in New York City like me. And 
there was a, a lot of variety, but somehow we were all drawn to uh, uh, the teachings that started to come alive for us for, that were born in India. Right, so th this text also doesn't say that what we're interested in, I suppose. It doesn't say that you're also an author of the book, The Life of Yogananda. That's because Awake came be out before my book. There you go. There, there it is. And it's called something else in India, isn't it? Tell us what it's called in India. Yes. Uh, the, my book, you see? Yes. The, this one. Um, in India, the, they chose to call it The Life and Times of Yogananda, and they used a different photograph. Right. So, uh, and uh, I've, I'm halfway through the book, and it's a fascinating, fascinating read. And it strikes me that you're you're writing it as a sort of um, uh, sorry impartial, impartial historian type uh, narration. Would you was that an accurate portrayal of, yes. of what you well, did? Well, that was yes. my goal. Certainly. Yes. And I make it clear at the beginning that I never became a, a disciple of Yogananda's or a, even a student. I had my own path, but he was a big influence on me. And I came to the book because I wrote about him in American Veda. And the chapter I wrote about him uh, because of his importance in the story of the history of these teachings coming to the West, uh, he deserved a chapter. And um, I got fascinated with his personal story, his human story, and of course didn't have enough space to do it justice. So after that book came out, a, a while afterward, I thought, you know, that's a great story and no one's done it. So I reread Autobiography of a Yogi to make sure there was, you know, because the initial reaction is why write a biography of the guy who wrote the famous autobiography? And, um, and I, I was correct in, in remembering that he left a lot out. And, and it was mainly to fill in those gaps. And most of what he left out is uh, his life after he comes to America, which is, you know, 32 years of his 59 years. And um, he, he, there was so much left out that I, I decided it would be a worthwhile project. And it, and it really was, uh, you know, eventful to sink my teeth into, you know, a life that unusual and worthy. I noticed that when I read the book that whenever um, uh, something supernatural happened in Yogananda's life, that you would um, apply this impartiality and then you would say, um, so this, this is there's this one version where he did something supernatural and there's this other version where this could be just um um a story that was glorified later on or um and i got interested by that because that that kind of um is something that um is is um i i would say um makes makes it um more easy to read for someone who is not um, on board with a lot of the supernatural beliefs that you have in, in yoga, for example. But I was uh, interested in what does the author think about those kind of things? Did you have a, do you have a certain um, point of view on this? Um, I, I, I approached it on a case by case basis. I, mm. in, my, in my research on these things, and I'll go back to when I was researching American Veda. I, as I said, I interviewed a lot of people. And when I asked them about what drew them to the teachings of yoga and Vedanta and Indian philosophy, many of them said someone gave them a book when they were young and it influenced their lives. And the book most often mentioned was Autobiography of a Yogi. And I discovered there are two kinds of people people who love the autobiography because of the miracles and the, all the, they love the miraculous tales and that really appealed to them. 
And the other group of the people who were influenced by that book, in spite of all the miracles, because they don't believe any of it, or they're very skeptical about it, but all the, the Yogananda's personal story, all the stories about the saints and, and Indi all the material about Indian philosophy and yoga and Kriya and all that, that's what drew them. The and the, the uh, descriptions of India at, at that time in history. Uh, but other people just are enamored of the miracles. And I, I'm kind of agnostic about such things and always have been. I'm wide open to the possibility that they're real, that, and, and I'm, I'm absolutely certain that human consciousness has capacities we ordinary people haven't dreamed of, and open to the possibility that very advanced yogis uh, can commonly do miraculous things. I mean, it's, there's enough evidence of that for me. And, and then you can infer from just the fact that my intuition has improved so much and my clarity of consciousness improves so much with my own meditation practice and all that. If you take that far enough, you can imagine being an advanced yogi and having that, those capacities. That said, I'm, I can't, I can't take on faith everything that is said to have happened because I would be more inclined, I am more inclined to uh, accept the things Yogananda said happened to him or he observed. But a lot of the stories in the book are things he heard about, and, and especially things he heard about when he was very young and you know, still in India as a teenager and a young man. So I've been to India enough times to know that um, a certain exaggeration may enter into these things. <laughs> and, and so I'm, I'm, you know, I can't say anything about particular stories. But in principle, and to his credit, Yogananda doesn't expect you to believe that stuff. He gives in his book and in his later talks and everything, um, the best he can of a, a reasonable, a rational and scientific explanation for those things. And, and I think the science we now have, nearly a hundred years afterward, is, uh, even more, um, uh, you can make an even stronger case for them, given all, all the advances in science since then. Mm. Fascinating. Um, let's take, uh, you, said you mentioned that you take the uh, supernatural and you take it case by case. So one, one part of the biography and indeed the autobiography you mentioned, he, um, after the, the passing of his um, birth mother, he was obviously very, very sad. And he, he obviously, he, he sat in meditation, you know, in pleas of, with, with God uh, to show him that, you know, if what his, you know, what, if he's if he's crying for real, if he'll never see his mother again, etc. And and in the autobiography of Yogi, he says they they say that um, or he writes that divine mother came to him there and then and reassured him, ever shall I love thee, um, always have I loved thee, ever shall I love thee, and, and the form of his mother, etc. appeared to him. Uh, so that that particular point uh, you treated very impartially um, in 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 your writing. I think you said um, something along the lines that it doesn't say whether that was. Uh, if she physically came to him in his in his visual perception, or was it a feeling? So, why don't you elaborate on your uh, of, on that particular case? How would you well, describe? I I treat it with the utmost respect and delicacy because it was life transforming for you know eleven year old Mukunda. I lost my mother when I was twenty one. That's that's very young, but it's not eleven. And, and, and it had a big impact on me. I didn't see Divine Mother. I would not have, and if I did, I would have told her to go away because <laughs> I, at the time I would have just assumed it was a trick or a ghost or something. But, uh, <laughs> um, but um, 
it, it was transformative, Tim. So you have to you have to give it credence, whether or not there was a physical manifestation in front of him, or something he imagined, or something he conjured. We don't know. We can't say. If we have we have to be objective. If you're a disciple of Yogananda's, you'd be inclined to say, if he said it happened, then it must have happened, and you know, Divine Mother appeared. But, you know, to, to the average person, especially in the West, the, the mere concept of, of, divine, of, a, of something called Divine Mother is hard enough to take. And if you say, well, you can think of it as the, the feminine form of God or, the, you know, the divine, uh, an aspect of, of the divine, um, then the question arises, yeah, well, what, what did, did he see something? Did a body appear? I said, I, I, I can't determine those things. But in my mind, it doesn't much matter. Because one thing we know about spirituality is, you know, in India, there's this concept of Ishta Devata, of your, your favored form of the divine. And, and people, uh, will have icons and you know statues and pictures of their the form of the divine that they're uh, drawn to which is why there are so many uh so-called deities in in india if you if that's the form and it could be you know a, a, a person your the guru figure whatever jesus whoever um if that's the form that you conjure in your mind often enough, at moments like that, something that's the more likely form for something to take. And was it some divine force speaking to Yogananda, communicating with him in some way? And when it ends up being uh, crystallized in a form that you can write about, and you have to vent, render into the written word, then it sounds like something you, you, you might get skeptical about. But I have no doubt that he experienced something deep and profound, whether, you know, whatever it was. And to him, it was the Divine Mother. So that's what it was. Yeah, even as uh, devotees, uh, all three of us are either Kriyabans or devotees of um, of Yogananda. So even as devotees, I think there's scope for objective, an objective view and take on each of those experiences. Because in in different parts of his text, he describes these experiences differently. He might, you know, imply things like in my mind's eye or in, you know, I, I heard or sometimes he says physic the physical manifestation other times he describes it in poetic uh, poetic uh, language so even for us i think uh, there is there is room for objectivity and we should be objective i think because we don't want as as meditators we don't want to focus on these experiences that yogananda has had and think uh, I, you know, I, I haven't made it. I'm not at that state because I cannot see Divine Mother. Divine Mother does not appear before me if I call upon her. What's wrong with me? <laughs> when will she come to me? Exactly you right. That you're, you're, that's to your credit. To that, as disciples, you would have that attitude, and I think Yogananda would respect that a lot. Because look at how he was with his own guru. You know, he was a questioning young man. And my experience with gurus who, you know, living gurus is they like when you ask tough questions. They don't want you to just believe everything they tell them. If they're good, you know, the real thing as teachers, they want you to learn to think and discriminate yourself. It's called viveka, viveka in, in Sanskrit, viveka, the discernment quality. They want you to cultivate that. So... Why should you? And why should you have those expectations? That's why Buddha, you know, is famously said, um, when asked if he performs miracles, he, he said, uh, I eat, I drink. When I'm thirsty, I drink. When I'm hungry, I eat. You know, that's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
you know, they don't want you to be enamored of those things. Yogananda is an interesting case because nobody wrote more about that stuff, <laughs> talked more about that stuff than he did. A lot of the gurus stayed away from that because they knew they were dealing with rational Westerners. But he was he was all he was all about that and many, you know, a lot. But at the same time, he, he told people not to get caught up in that stuff. And that's classic yogic teaching. You know, you can get they can be distractions. Phil, um, you, you said that you didn't pursue the path of Yogananda. You, you didn't quite follow follow his path and SRF path. But what, what path did you choose to follow or have you choose to follow any? When I read Autobiography of a Yogi, I had already uh, taken up Transcendental Meditation. It was uh, about several months after the Beatles were in India with Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. Uh, and I always just say, oh, I, I didn't learn how to meditate because of the Beatles. I did it because I'm a real seeker and I, you know. But the Beatles made, <laughs> made us all very aware of, of those things and made them, you know, uh, uh, appealing in a different, in a way <laughs> that was uh, unique. Um, so I had taken that as my practice, and it was working quite well for me. Uh, and I ended up becoming a teacher of that. And it was in those during that time period um, that I was reading all kinds of things. And that's when Autobiography of a Yogi was uh, being passed around in different circles. And I read it and it, it, it was inspiring and it reinforced a lot. And I learned a tremendous amount. And <laughs> this is the copy I read in 1970. Wow. 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 And I have moved, I used to move almost like once a year back in the 70s and 80s, but this stayed with me. And it says it was $5. <laughs> and I know, and I've said this publicly, I know I wouldn't have had $5 to spend on a hardcover book in 1970. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember who it was, but somebody loaned it to me and I never returned it. And so <laughs> I always say that um, I wrote about Yogananda uh, with such love because I'm giving back, I'm paying off that karmic debt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, so that became my principal uh, sadhana, my practice. It's interesting that you mentioned the Beatles. Um, I feel like they conveyed a lot of um, uh, information about yoga into the West by by going there. So did some others, but I feel like they were like really important in, in this time. And for example, my own mother, she found Yogananda by reading about George Harrison, reading about him having read the autobiography of a yogi. That's kind of he used to give how she out. got on the path. Yeah. They were, um, I begin American Veda by uh, saying, I, I can't remember the exact words, but I say, you know, in February, it was February, 1968, the Beatles went to India and I called it the most momentous spiritual retreat since Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. And I kept thinking, I'm going to get in trouble for that. People are going to, you know, I'm going to get angry emails. I'm going to, you know, no one's ever argued with me, <laughs> so, which means either they don't care or I'm right, you know, because it was it had a huge impact on, on you know, the whole world, really. That's a whole, you know, subject for a whole conversation. But you're, you're right. It was it was enormous. Absolutely. And um, I, I oh, sorry. Go for it. No, no, go for it. Go. I might finish. I uh, yeah, just a follow up was that I feel like um, uh, raising awareness for, I would say, spirituality is something that that is encouraged to do, I feel like, and, uh, and it's also uh, rewarding. And even when we do this podcast, we feel like um, we want to encourage people to um, um, 
think about Yogananda or think about spirituality. And do you feel like, um, did you feel that same kind of way when you wrote the book about Yogananda? Oh, yes. I, a large part of my uh, work uh, has been um, just because it's satisfying on a personal level, you know, the, the term Dharma comes into play here. I just feel like a lot of what I was, have been able to do as a writer and a speaker and teacher and all that uh, has been uh, just my calling. Um, but there is a, I'm also aware that um, if I do it right, it will help people in their lives and it will advance not only uh, the, the, the spiritual development of the reader, but in a certain way, make a, contri a larger contribution too. So I felt telling Yogananda's story was a, a ha in, in, in a particular way served a similar purpose as American Veda did in a larger way. American Veda covers a couple of hundred years of, of history and all the players and all that. This takes one of them and goes into detail. And, and I felt that um, one of the functions, one of, the, my, one of my purposes was not just, you know, one of the purposes was to just tell a good story. This is a unique and interesting life that, you know, I, as a storyteller, it was a joy to tell. And as a lover of stories, it was a joy to, to learn about. But on another level, I thought Yogananda is so revered to the point of uh, being worshipped by many people, and at least, you know, as a mentor, as a guide, as a guru. Um, and I felt a lot of people... Um, have him on such a high pedestal, almost in a saintly way, that the human side gets lost. And we're all human. And if we're going to have spiritual role models, um, their humanity should also inspire us, not just their consciousness and their, you know, miracles or whatever. Um, and, and so I wanted, it's, it's, it's not taking him off a pedestal, it's embellishing the pedestal, it's putting the pedestal in a context that's also human. And so I wanted to tell the human story of Yogananda. Um, and I think, I, and the feedback I get from, you know, devotees is that it, it was useful to them. It was important for them to hear that Yogananda struggled, that Yogananda had challenges he had to face, that there were times he got upset. Because, you know, you don't want to hear those. Those things don't get talked about a lot. He, had to, he worried about money, you know, and, and that makes him more relatable in my eyes than somebody who's above it all. No, he was running an organization and doing so, you know, during the Great Depression, during World War II. He was, he was a victim of racism. He was a victim of religious uh, uh, bigotry. Uh, he was attacked by people. You know, he, he, was, he had a lot of challenges in the world, and as we all do. And so I felt that by writing the truth, you know, the full story, uh, I think it would help people in their own spiritual uh, challenges and, and searches and all that. Because a lot of people, you get on a spiritual path and you're meditating and all this and you think life should just be easy now and then so stuff happens. And you think there's something wrong with you because you're a yogi and you should be above all this stuff. Well, you know, no. <laughs> if you're, you know, if you get COVID, or if you know somebody you love dies, or if you know your you know your business collapses. I mean, these are real issues in life, 
paying the bills and all that. And to the extent Yogananda also had to deal with certain things, even, even though he was a monk and you're not, um, I think it make, it, it's useful for people to understand that and to learn about it. I, I like to retell the story when Yogananda realized that he was getting addicted to coffee because <laughs> it's such a relatable, relatable thing. And I think he, he talks about it in, in quite a carefree way to say he, he realized, you know, one day he was going to so many meetings and in every meeting was, do you want a cup of tea or coffee? And he would say, you know, yes, thank you very much and take a cup of coffee. And, but because he was going out and spreading the word so much, he was, he was constantly on, on this coffee buzz. I, I, I love sharing that story because um, so many people, you know, in the spiritual path, you try to cleanse yourself. And I think me, me and the guys, we, we were talking about this fairly recently, like what, what's your poison? You know, these days the poison's a, a croissant and a, and a coffee or something. Um, but it, it's important not, not to get too hung up in, you know, these things and to enjoy life and everything uh, for, for the humanity of it. Yeah. And, you know, he doesn't write about himself in those ways too much in Autobiography of a Yogi. But if, if you read other things he wrote and listen to the speeches he's given and all that, he was, he was pretty open about certain things, and especially in the letters that I was able to see to people. Um, so we, we know a lot, but um, unless you read a book like mine or do the research I've done, uh, you don't necessarily see little things like how he liked practical jokes and, and love to go see Western movies, you know, in, and, and get in the car and have picnics or, you know, cook a meal for friends. You know, these are human things that, uh, you know, we, 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 we just want to, you know, put the gurus up on a cloud, but they're human. And he got, he, he got ill toward the end of his life. And, you know, he, he, he was not well physically. I mean, these are, th but yet look, if you look at how he handled the challenges and, and the dignity and the grace that he maintained, that's inspiring. That to me is more inspiring than some image of perfection that uh, no human being ever really attains. <laughs> it, it reminds me, Phil, um... I think it was uh, spiritually health. You wrote an article uh, on all places are alive with with holiness. Uh, if if you recall, maybe it's probably one of the many articles you've written. But uh, I think you were saying there in, in this article that you know uh, uh, sacred space is is everywhere. Oh, uh, space, yeah. Sacred space and holiness, yeah. Uh, and it, it's you know divinity, omnipresence, these these things. It's you know, Yogananda teaches that, uh, you know, spirit descends uh, into 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 the physical form, the gross material form. So therefore, everything actually is a uh, derivative of spirit. So uh, it, it kind of triggers my thought on this: that engaging life and, and everything that it entails is is part of the spiritual process. So, yeah, yeah, we're embodied for a reason. I mean, you know, this is the the vehicle of awakening, as Buddha called it. And yes, everything is sacred. And, you know, that shed outside my window here is, is a sacred space. But the other truth is, if you go to the Self-Realization Fellowship's Lake Shrine, near not half hour from where I live, it feels different for, than my backyard. Mm -hmm. And some places hold it and make well, it, you know, uh, more accessible than others, even though divinity is omnipresent. So both of those things are true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's pick up on something you said uh, a little bit a while ago about the influence of. Um... Yogananda, and you mentioned that's principally what American Veda I see is about uh, about the influence of Eastern, you know, philosophy and spirituality on 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 Americas and and Europe and the West, I suppose. And let's uh, I'd like to draw a parallel, um, if you will, like for example, 
you know, in India we have great, you know, great sages and and saints that have that have littered the history of India. I think you know, sages like Shankaracharya and Agastya Muni, and they they didn't just come and go. They they travelled the breadth and depth of India, and they instilled not a teaching but actually something that became a fabric of the culture. Yeah, and that spirituality people are practicing even without knowing. You know, in India, they even without knowing that they're practicing spirituality, it's just the, the, a custom that they that has been passed down through through generations. And I'm I'm interested. You know, you talk about the influence of uh, you know of that in, in in America, but can you talk about how the influence of it has actually? We we see the external impact, i.e., you know, people doing hatha yoga and yoga classes. But can you talk about? Is there any any a bit more depth about the sut subtle nature in which? I know oh, this yeah. is a very difficult question, probably, but the subtle nature in no, which it's not a difficult question because I did all the research and I've written about it and talked about it so much. It's not a difficult question. The difficulty is saying it in less than 300 pages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, yes, no, the, the, in my eyes, and I'm not alone in this, um, we talked before about the Beatles, that was a watershed moment, but <clears throat> these teachings have been filtering into the West for hundreds of years. It just built up and accelerated <clears throat> with the uh, advent of mass media and community and transportation technology and all that. So by the time of the Beatles, uh, them getting on a plane and going to India and ending up in an ashram is, was easy. And you know, the, the guru Maharshi Mahesh Yogi was traveling the world on jet planes. You know, it was different in Yogananda's day and even more different in Vivekananda's day in the late 19th century. Um, and so, and prior to that, it was only books. The, you know, the translations and commentaries were filtering in and influencing important people like the British romantic poets and Ralph Waldo Emerson and people like that. And so that influence built and built and built. And there were watershed moments like Yogananda coming and, and staying in, in the West, uh, the first of the major gurus to do that. And then the Beatles and the whole counterculture thing and all the other gurus who came in the 60s and 70s, and then everything that's followed. It's changed, I, I can't speak for uh, other cultures, but in, the, in America, uh, research organizations occasionally do surveys of how people understand religion and practice religion and what they, how they identify. And you see a trend and those trends all are in the direction of Vedanta philosophy and yoga philosophy. So people um, are more inclined to define themselves spiritually in terms of their inner experience of the divine as opposed to what a belief system or dogma. They're more inclined to identify as uh, independent seekers on a quest as opposed to members of a particular uh, religious tradition or church or whatever. Um, they're more inclined to recognize that uh, core uh, teaching from India that uh, all paths lead to the same realization. And if you take each path deeply enough, they're all valid pathways. So respect for other traditions other than your own and as, as valid means of uh, spiritual development, that has grown. So, and there's many other indications, but those kind of things represent a transformation of how we understand religion and spirituality and how we engage that impulse. It's like earlier we were talking, you're, you're all uh, devotees, you're all disciples of Yogananda, but you still are thinking clearly and you will respect people on other paths as being 
uh, not unlike yourselves, uh, that you have in common, you know, a, a devotion to a spiritual pursuit. And if you were to sit down and compare your experiences, they would not be that different. And you acknowledge that, just as Yogananda did. That's not the way things were in the West before the influence of, of the Eastern teachings. I was interviewing yesterday for one of my uh, podcast things, a uh, Episcopal priest who's uh, a leader in the, in the world of contemplative Christianity. And his story was, he was raised Catholic and rejected it and you know went to india and had gurus and everything and then redefined his christianity and ended up ordained in a mainstream tradition but not being very mainstream in his you know approach to his his ministry uh and that's and he was saying very explicitly you know if it wasn't for east and india uh, none of this would be possible in his life. And he's one of many. What, what do you make of Yogananda's take on Jesus Christ having uh, gone to India and come back? And it's, it's one of the most fascinating things about him and his work and his life. One of the things I discovered very early on, even before I read Autobiography of a Yogi, was that the, uh, the teachers in India, the gurus, the philosophers, I, I read a book called uh, Sermon on the Mount According to Vedanta, before I even read Autobiography of a Yogi. They all respected Jesus, and, and Indians love Jesus, you know, they, but they see him as a great guru, or in some cases as a divine incarnation, right up there with Krishna and Rama and Buddha. In other cases, just a great holy man, a great sadguru. Um, and they they'd be happy if you know. There's you know the classic stories of, in India of the missionaries is they convince people about Jesus, and and. They say, okay, oh, that's great. I'll put a statue of him in my house. And it's right next to Ganesha and Krishna and all that. And the, and the, and the missionaries say, no, you have to get rid of all those false gods. <laughs> Why? You know? but, but that's how, that's what I understand. And I found that to be the case in India, you know. And, and mm -hmm. in Vivekananda's lineage, if uh, you're a... Uh, uh, if you become a devotee, if you want to be initiated in that order, but you your your favored uh, form of the divine is Jesus or his mother Mary, then you are given a, a mantra accordingly. They don't you know don't say no. You have to be Hindu. So, <clears throat> but G, but Yogananda took it to another level. <clears throat> that respect for Jesus the interpretation of him and his mission as a yogic one, that's common. Yogananda gives him a place in his own lineage and makes claims that, you know, Jesus and Babaji were in cahoots, you know, for the whole divine plan uh, and the claim that he, he, he was not only reviving and modernizing the yoga tradition, but also Christianity. That's, that was very bold. And people have said, oh, he was just selling out to, because he was teaching in the Christian West. Well, he didn't have to go that far if he wasn't sincere about it. All he had to do was what the other teachers did was show respect for Jesus and put a you know a cross on their altar or something. He went very far, and you know I'm staring right here at you know two volumes of his writings and talks about uh, Christ, you know, the second coming of Christ. So that's a fascinating piece of his story. And I can tell you, it has changed, his take on it, on Jesus, changed 
the minds of a great many uh, Christians who had abandoned the church, you know, for being, for various reasons, that, you know, that people abandon church, especially when they're young. <clears throat> he made them look at Jesus in a different way. I know people who became serious devotees of Yogananda, but they have a lot of trouble with the altar because Jesus is on it and they have to overcome that either because <clears throat> they're Jews or Muslims or atheists who didn't like Jesus, the Christian and the Christian church, or because they had abandoned it themselves and found something better. And now they're being asked to like Jesus again. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know, it's an interesting spiritual challenge, but it, it it allowed people to redefine this story of this person that's, you know, so central to Western civilization. And, and so many just reject that story and become secular and spirit, you know, anti-religion and everything. Yogananda gave them a way back to having respect and love for Jesus because a lot of people abandoned the church for various reasons, political reasons, uh, that the church's take on sexuality and all the other things. Um, but they still had a fondness for Jesus and, you know, the memories of being in church and at, at, at mass when they were children and all that. And this gave them a way back. So, you know, there's lots to be said about it. And I, I don't have an opinion on, just as I don't have an opinion on the, on the miracles uh, Yogananda writes about, I can't possibly have an opinion about his take on the resurrection story or any of that. Those are mysteries beyond my comprehension. But I can say what I just did, you know, and, and on, a, on a real level of human life and the importance of, of Christ in world history, Yogananda's uh, contribution to that and his take on that has meant a, a great deal to a whole lot of people. Yeah, we're interviewing Professor Clooney from from Harvard. Oh, he was in the great. he was in the he was in the movie. Hopefully, we we'll, we we'll get, we'll get to him next month. But he were, he said, "Oh, you know, a lot of the things that I said about um, the second coming of Christ and Yogananda's take on Christ it didn't make the movie." So I'm going to really I really love to take oh, this I'll opportunity. I look forward to that. Um, <laughs> you know, I have a, I'm going to plug my own podcast called it's called Spirit Matters. We have a couple of hundred uh, 250 interviews used in the in the archive. A number of we have a whole, maybe six, seven devoted to Yogananda with various people. Uh, and we interviewed Frank Clooney just a few weeks ago. And he told me that off camera too, or maybe it was on camera. I can't remember. I'll look forward to that. <laughs> Great. Go on, Mike, you were saying something? Yeah, I'm go going back to what we were saying before. Um, so Yogananda mentioned on, on a lot of occasions that before the world can unite, um, the religions of the world will have to unite. And do you feel like this um, link that he draws with Jesus having been to India and somehow creating like a, almost a common origin story, do you think this could be part of us all realizing our brotherhood? I don't know about the you know specifics in your question about Jesus in India and all that, because most people are not going to believe that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm those missing years in Jesus' life, people will be speculating that about that a thousand years from now too. Uh, even though, you know, and if you, I'm told that if you go to Kashmir, there are people who will for a few rupees show you where Jesus <laughs> was, but you know. Um, so I don't know about that, but his, his teaching and all the guru's teachings, all the, the saints of India and the rishis of India, all those teachings about the, the common core of all religious traditions and the um, central role that deep inner experience plays in the religious life and in the spiritual life, that is having an impact. And when people have, uh, when people, 
here in America, there's a huge uh, growth in what's being called contemplative Christianity. People, you know, in a Christian context, engaging in forms of meditation that derive from the East or are being rediscovered in their own tradition and that were long buried because of the um, influence of people like Yogananda. To me, that's the critical issue, that shift from faith-based religion, from dogma to, to trans inner transformation through spiritual practices and experiences and a perspective that puts that in the forefront uh, and makes dogma, the, you know, the different views of history, and this whole notion that there's only one true religion, it's making those things obsolete. And that to me is, is the hope. And when people see that, and I've seen this, you know, the pandemic is going to have a big effect I hope on people's consciousness, because if that didn't teach us that we're all connected and, and that, you know, we, we have shared responsibilities to one another's welfare as a species, <laughs> nothing will. But it, on a spiritual level, the, um, the legitimization of the spiritual technologies from the East is, is a much bigger deal than people realize. I get mailings from my healthcare provider. And in the last year, the mailings include why I should meditate to reduce stress <laughs> and, and all that. It's great. A little late in my case, but you know, there it is. <laughs> that they have yoga classes. And, you know, this is... This was not the case 20 years ago, much less 50 years ago, much less 100 years ago. So when Yogananda was talking about this stuff, and one of the things we should uh, mention is how skillful he was in adapting these traditional teachings of uh, his Kriya Yoga lineage and just Indian philosophy in general, to the new culture he found himself in, in the 1920s, uh, you know, nearly 100 years ago, things were very different then. And you could see how he adapted in the titles of his lectures and in the offerings he made, he, he started to learn what would appeal to Americans. And so you see things like uh, yoga for health, and well-being and, and, and that sort of thing. And he realized people care about that stuff. Well, that, that would have been really shocking news in you know, 1920, 1922. And now it's commonplace. It's just ordinary. And, and while you know, people may take up certain practices just because it's good for their health or because they want to look better something happens in many cases it, in inwardly it happens something some shift in consciousness takes place and if they're lucky enough to be taught that yoga is not just a physical exercise and that there's more to it that's a path to personal transformation that has profound religious and spiritual implications so i you know, and so therefore Yogananda's legacy, like the legacy of Vivekananda before him and the people who came after him, uh, that imprint will outlast even the memory of who these people were. Yogananda is more likely to endure because of the you know, autobiography of a yogi and the, the, uh, the institutions that uh, remain strong. But um, that impact is huge. And I, I, I may not live long enough to see my predictions <laughs> prove it, but I, I hope uh, 
you know, it's becoming obvious. And also perhaps the movie Awake. Let's segue into that now. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, that uh, has made a very real impression on, on lots of different uh, audiences around the world. Let's talk about how you became involved with that project, Phil. Um, well, it was because of American Veda. Um, I have a chapter in there. I, so my his, the historical perspective of that I just described, that, that's in American Veda. The people at SRF respected how I handled the, my, the chapters on Yogananda. They respected that. They, they respected uh, the way I placed him in the context of the larger story. And so I had a good relationship with them. And it turns out the filmmakers had read American Veda and read other things I'd written about Yogananda and said. And so uh, they invited me to, uh, they wanted to interview me for the, um, for the film. And I ended up with a lot of screen time. I didn't yes, you did. That. You did. You know, and, and I think, that, to be perfectly honest, one of the reasons was uh, because I had that historical perspective and was able to insert it, it when they wanted it in the book, but also because I lived near them. <laughs> <laughs> so when they needed, you know, when there was something they needed added, you know, they said, oh, well, Phil lives nearby. Let's get Phil to say it. <laughs> so uh, maybe I'm being too humble, but I, I suspect <laughs> that had something to do with it. But um, I, it was a great uh, experience for me and an honor to be part of it and to be on screen with such great people. Did you, did you, did they film it in your house? Because I noticed on lots of, of the scenes no, you were, not, oh, not okay. Oh, okay, because there's a, I saw a, a Nataraja form, a Shiva yeah. dancing form in the background. So I was gonna ask you about that, but that's not your house. Not my house, but no. you know, they're, they're professionals. They found, a, you know, they had a little set decoration. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, what were your thoughts on the film? Oh, I had great respect for the film. I, I, I went to the premiere, you know, when they showed it at SRF and I was on a, 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 a several panels when it was screened. And uh, I have a lot of respect for the filmmakers and the film and frankly for SRF for, uh, giving the filmmakers um, uh, enough freedom to, to, to make a, you know, a good film and not just a, uh, what, what could easily have been seen as just, you know, uh, hagiography or, or, or uh, propaganda. It, it was good filmmaking and they, they did a, a, a reasonably good job, I think, of the telling the human story. They had, you know, only 90 minutes. They couldn't do what I ended up doing. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the, the biography of him, because I saw even the film couldn't do it justice. And there was, a, you know, they had to leave a lot out. And, and uh, but they also did a, a good job of showing it in the time they had that human side of him like people learned for example about some you know one of the lawsuits he had to endure through watching awake but what they didn't know was there was a second one 10 years later that was also a big upheaval in his life they just couldn't include everything did you write i imagine you were already writing the book whilst they were filming no maybe i was i can't remember you know but i I, may, I can't remember when it, I actually started. I don't think so. No, I no? may have been thinking about doing it. But <laughs> I didn't, I, yeah. gave you the, the movie gave you the inception. Well, it just, crystallized. It, it reinforced the notion that there's more to tell mm. and that, you know, a book could do what a film couldn't and an outsider could do what, uh, you know, somebody representing or Yogananda's lineage couldn't do. Absolutely. And have more credibility. Absolutely. Did you, so you, you said, you said you were, um, uh, you, that you interviewed for various, sorry, they, they, they 
they they they they came over to you at various points um, to to record things. How much of your no, they, they didn't come to me because they just because uh, <laughs> they I went to where they were filming. Okay, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. whichever way around, how how much of the narrative that you portray the different elements and different parts of his life how much was that was that did they present a theme that they wanted you to discuss was there a script that you guys agreed well, how did that work as i recall the first were them interviewing me you mm -hmm. don't hear their voices mm -hmm. and then they took uh, from you know long conversations on on camera what they needed but then there were a few other times when they said, you know, we need a transition from this, or we need you to say something ab uh, about the uh, atmosphere of the 1920s when Yogananda arrived. So I just spoke and then they might say, you know, can you make it shorter? Or, you know, you, can you add this? And yeah, you know, it was just showbiz, man. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't tell me what to say and you know and, and give me a script or anything but they said you know we have 30 seconds or a minute to fill in this information so we would have a conversation and then i would speak it it was definitely very natural and free-flowing so it didn't feel scripted at all so if you'd said that it was then i was going to say you were a very good actor and that is the show business but no it felt very beautifully natural and you gave you gave a really good good feel what did you enjoy, enjoy the most phil of uh, of taking part in the awake documentary then oh it was fun you know every time i was with the filmmakers and yeah we had it was a good time and to you know i love talking about this stuff you can you can probably tell it means a lot to me, I think, it, and it's important. And so, uh, you know, it was, the, and the filmmakers made it very pleasant. And so, I, I you know, it, it just feels like the right thing to be doing. And so uh, I do, you know, I never say no to an opportunity to speak about this stuff. And so it was like the conversation we're having now, you know, we would, and, you know, as long as there were snacks and tea, I was fine. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I was just saying your portrayal, your, your rendition, your, you were very natural in your, um, in your portrayal of the different events in your Gananda's life and your feelings of the culture and, and all those kind of things. So you did a really good job. So it de definitely didn't feel like show business from the audience's uh, perspective. So you did a cracking job. No, I was joking. But no, it was, it, was, it was a good, fun experience. Um, you, uh, you mentioned earlier that um, when you saw the movie was being made, you felt like there is more story to tell. Is there like a certain story or a certain part of Yogananda's life that you wanted to emphasize on that you felt like wasn't told enough at all? Yes, and I, and then I discovered even more when I dug into the research, you know, because you I knew enough to say there's a lot of that he left out and it must be interesting. For example, um, one of the keys to me was he says in Autobiography of a Yogi, something like, and five years passed in Boston. And I said, wait <laughs> a minute, wait a minute. This guy arrives at age 27 in Boston in 1920 on a ship. This was the first year women got to vote in America. He, he arrives in September, the elections in November. Automobiles were new. Radio was not even in people's homes yet. That would be another few years. The Ku Klux Klan was huge in America in the 20s. It was, it was having a resurgence. The Irish were being discriminated against in Boston. And here's this dark-skinned guy in orange with long hair 
what was that like? What was winter like? I lived in Boston. It's cold. <laughs> you know, October in Boston's colder than Calcutta ever gets. You know, so I'm, you know, what was this like? And so I dug in and I, and I had, you know, wanted to tell that those stories. So part of it was that curiosity. Um, what was it like in the depression? Why did he stay? Why did, what was it like when he traveled cross country, you know, in days when before the interstate highway, you know, you know, 1925 automobile. Um, why did he choose to live in LA? What was it like when he got, I mean, there were all these stories. What was it like to run an organization? And then I knew about certain lawsuits and controversies that had occurred. But then when I got in and read the newspapers at the time and the correspondence and all that. And so I knew there was a lot that hadn't been told. And I wanted to know, you know, businesses were failing in the 1930s. Very high skilled businessmen were going broke. How did he run an organization with spiritual devotees as volunteers? And how did it survive? Did he worry about money? Well, it turns out, yes, he was worried about money a lot. And, you know, they barely survived. Uh, all those kind of questions. Was he ill before he died? People don't talk about that. He was only 59 when he passed. Um, what was his last days like? That interested me a lot. And one of the writing about his last days and the day of his passing was the most moving part of, as a writer to get into the details of that and to tell the, that story. I found it, you know, he was terribly brave, terribly um, devoted to his mission to the point where he probably worked more than he should have in the last years of his life and harder. Uh, and there was a sweetness to it because he knew his days were limited that writing about him in his earlier times was different. The other thing was um, seeing that the Yogananda we we know about, the, the spiritual master, the great teacher, um, the, the um, imprint of that, you could see when he was a child. And especially when he was an adolescent, he was, you know, I write in the book that we all had the experience as teenagers of, you know, being maybe mischievous and um, that there was always somebody who in, in America we call the ringleader. And Yogananda was a ringleader, only he was, ring, he was bringing people to satsangs and, and to temples and to, to, to see gurus as opposed to being the ringleader who, you know, let's go steal a car <laughs> or, you know, whatever it is that, you know, forbidden stuff. So he was a rebel in, in the sense of being more spiritual or you could say more religious than even, you know, he was expected to be at the expense of his schoolwork, uh, you know? So th that was interesting, you know, to me, the, 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 to see the, the, um, that, you know, the, the child is father to the man, as they say in, in Yogananda's life. All that was interesting, his family, his father, uh, you know, and then I, t I lead tours to India and a, a couple of times we've been to Kolkata and, We've gone to the home where he lived as a, as a teenager. Also to see the historical context. What was Calcutta like in those days? What, what were his influences? 
the influence of Vivekananda and Sri Ramakrishna on him. Uh, these are were all interesting things to me. Uh, and then, but I think the big, uh, one of the big things was, <coughs> how did he succeed in America? What did he do? Because the autobiography of a yogi is largely responsible for, you know, his enduring fame and, you know, him becoming a household word. But that was published in 1946. That was 26 years after he came here. How did he survive? How did his teaching spread? How did he do what he did? And that aspect of being a, a skillful at adapting to American culture was a big part of the story. But also what he endured. And you know what else impressed me was um, he was a monastic, but he, he, un, he knew what was going on in the world. And he spoke out. He spoke out, you know, against war and he spoke out against violence. He spoke out against racism and bigotry and uh, all kinds of things. Um, there was even a letter published from him in the New York Times advocating <clears throat> the change in immigration policies so people from India could become citizens. That didn't come to pass till 1965, but so he was an engaged yogi. And I think that's something also worth uh, our admiration and, and emulating. How, how did, what was, the, what was the most influential thing that you've taken from Yogananda in your own life? There was a certain authenticity to him that um, I came to really in like and respect. Uh, and for all his otherworldliness and, you know, th you know, teachings about having our attention on, on the divine and our realization, our growth towards self-realization, um, he still uh, was human. That humanness that he, you know, enjoyed telling silly jokes, that he enjoyed the company of human, other human beings, you know, and uh, there was a, he, he manifested a lot of love for those around him. Fortunately, he lived long enough for recordings to be made of some of his talks and informal talks with disciples. And I would encourage people to listen to those because SRF has digitized them. And a certain quality comes through in those taken late in his life, but it's like him hanging out, you know, not just hanging out, but in a somewhat informal context, in some instances, some are formal, talks he gave um, and there's a warmth and a humanity that I, I appreciate it but also you know I think what I came away with and what a lot of people who read my book tell me they came away with was if Yogananda had to struggle with things like money and squabbles among disciples and people trying to bring him down and racism and all the rest of it, then my troubles are more endurable. And that I must, <clears throat> I've been on a spiritual path this long and I'm devoted to my uh, meditation and my, or whatever form of sadhana people have. I can't complain when my life gets messy and say, oh, I should be above all that. Well, Yogananda showed you have to deal with this stuff, even while being above all that. You can't ignore it. It's gonna upset you. It's gonna make you angry. It's gonna make you upset, sad, whatever it is. You're gonna to want to, as, as he used to say, I just, I don't wanna do this anymore. I wanna go back to India and, and you know, live the life of a, you know, sannyasi 
which is what he he was. He was a renoun a renunciate. I want to just go into you know the Himalayas or by the Ganges. Well, we all have thoughts like that. This world is too ridiculous. It's too messy. It's too stressful. It's too crazy. I just want to go live in an ashram. And I always say, yeah, well, when you go to the ashram, you'll find that the monk next door is a pain in the neck too. <laughs> and, and you're going you're gonna to start complaining about the, you know, there's not enough hot water or the food's too spicy. So, you know, there's always in the world, there's always stuff. And if Yogananda can endure it and, you know, you can too. <laughs> What would you say your favorite chapter in the autobiography is? Oh, gosh. I, I would have to think too much and take up too much of your time uh, <laughs> for that. You know, I, okay, what comes to mind is not just one, but there were the, the chapter he devotes to uh, when he was with Gandhi and the chapter he devotes to uh, uh, being his, his visit to India his one year in India after being here for 15 years. I loved writing about that and his return from India uh, because uh, his meetings with Anandamoy Ma, Ramana Maharshi, uh, Gandhi, I don't know why, but that had a big impact on me when I was young, when I read it for the first time. Uh, his respect for them, his admiration for them, his humility with them. <laughs> and I was able to find uh, in the Ramana Maharshi uh, ashram, I was not there, but someone sent it to me. Uh, there was more about their encounter than Yogananda wrote about. So I was able to add some stuff. Uh, so it, those were probably what I remember most if, if i can be rude guys just i'll jump in and ask a, a third question in a row um i promise you can you can uh, ask the next ones um i'm, I'm curious phil like when, when did you first realize you had a passion for spirituality and, and, and a passion for writing and when did you really combine the two it was at first you know just my own search for uh answers to questions that i wasn't I wasn't getting satisfactory answer to, you know, the important questions of life when I was in college. Who am I? What am I doing here? What's life about? How do you, how can you be happy and fulfilled? What's going on? And then in the context of that search, it was, you know, the, everything you've heard about the 1960s, you know, the drugs and the hippies and the music and, and everything else. And in that mix, we were those of us who were serious about the search somehow were discovering the teachings from the east and that somehow had a big impact on me and there was a moment i i moved from new york to boston and someone suggested i go to the museum in boston where they had a room of a buddhist statuary it's called the temple room and that experience coupled with the reading i was doing I was reading books about Zen and books about mysticism, books about Vedanta. Seeing the faces of the Buddha in the statues, I remember having the thought, whatever those guys had, I want it. Because, you know, the, you could just feel this, the wisdom and the consciousness and the peace. And that, those were moments like that. And I said, oh, if this is what people mean by spirituality, if this is what people mean by religion, then I've been misled. And, you know, all the rest of the stuff I thought was, you know, religion. <laughs> uh, all that stuff is, I can still reject, but there's this stuff, no one ever told me about this. No one ever told me about you know, the mystical traditions. No one ever told me about meditation. No one ever told me that uh, you don't have to believe in silly superstitious things or some hypothetical history. 
or, or go against science. That was a big deal for me to discover that the Eastern traditions and the people like Yogananda and Vivekananda before him, they had no problem with science. <laughs> you know, they were perfectly compatible with scientific method and reasoning and uh, evidence and all that. That, that meant a lot to me. And when I met my teacher, uh, when I learned TM, he, he always used to say, you know, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. Just do the practices and see if they work for you. And I said, okay, I'm on board for, with that. <laughs> you know, so that was a big deal. And, and that kind of practical approach to spirituality is part of the, you know, the, the, the positive trends you see over the last 40, 50 years. <laughs> well, can I just say thank you very much, Phil, for uh, for your time and your energy. It's been absolutely lovely to meet the man behind the um, the film and also the book, the lovely writing. The I'm only on screen. I'm not behind the film. Those <laughs> filmmakers deserve credit for that. Yeah, behind the. the I scene. will take credit for the book. <laughs> <laughs> books and uh, you yourself no doubt will uh, will have left a lasting impression on the, the fabric of uh, american vid as it continues to evolve no doubt so uh, kudos and superb superb service and work that you're doing thank you thanks for inviting me it's been a pleasure and mm -hmm. uh keep up the good work with what you do now i know about your your series i'll have to uh tune in yes uh, you should tune into, especially to the bits where you have a dialogue, because we're gonna we analyze what you're saying as well. <laughs> yeah, when will, will you'll let me know when this yeah. airs? Yeah, I'll, I'll do. I'll we'll spread do. the word. Yes, that'd be superb. Thank you. Thank you and so then much. you'll be stars. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> God help us all. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, Chris, do you have any any last remarks? No, I uh, just hope people out there continue to be inspired by Yogananda and the teachings that he represents and to treat them with the respect uh, that they deserve and to uh, help preserve their integrity. Right. Mike, Chris, anything? I was, I was just going to say Gu Guruji is a star and thank you for coming on, Phil. My pleasure. <laughs> Chris? Yeah. Probably got about 30, 40 more questions, but so you know, it would if it be um, you know, food, you know, food for thought, and uh, you know, you're, I, I would just say anybody listening, um, there's some great material that Phil has out there, so uh, check it out on YouTube on on the website. Um, uh, is it Spirit uh, Matters Spirit Matters Talk dot com? Spirit Matters Talk dot com, mm -hmm. and so, we now have a YouTube channel. Ever we started video as well as audio. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, check check it out there. And I, I was especially excited about some of the things you mentioned in the, in the YouTube video, which, uh, yes, yeah, too much to talk about, but the studies of consciousness and, and where that's going in the future. Uh, yeah. It's, another uh, time, it, Chris. Another time. Another time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for, for, uh, for your time today. Take care, guys. Take care. Take care.